Okay, welcome back. Uh, I actually have a longer lecture on memory controllers, but I wanted to touch them, uh, touch on them before we move to memory reliability and security, the row hammer issue uh, and other security and reliability problems. So this should go quickly, I think, but it should be very interesting because it's a fascinating topic. Uh, so okay, this is where we stopped yesterday, actually. We were uh, learning some background on DRAM and memory, and this is where it came to. Uh, this, as I said, this is a fascinating topic because essentially all long latency memories have similar characteristics that need to be controlled. And these are some of the most complicated parts of a system, as we will see soon. And the following discussion, this lecture, this lecture 2A, will use DRAM uh, as an example. Uh, but keep in mind that many decisions scheduling and control issues are similar in the design of controllers in other types of memories, like SSD controllers. I'll give you some references to SSD controllers. This is true for uh, flash memory, which is most SSDs today. And other emerging memory technologies also, phase change memory, spin transfer torque magnetic memory, memristors, they need characteristics that need to be controlled. DRAM is just one example where the protocols are very well set today. And these other technologies can place other demands on the controller also. For example, DRAM doesn't have a problem called the endurance problem. Are you, are you familiar with the endurance problem in memories? So basically flash memory or many emerging memory technologies, non-volatile memories, have the problem that if you keep writing to the memory, to a particular cell, after some number of writes you cannot write or read, meaning that uh, the cell wears out. And this is due to many, other, many different, different mechanisms and different technologies for example, in phase change memory, because whenever you write, you expose the memory to very high temperatures, the contacts uh, next to the cells break down at, uh, after so many number of writes, and as a result, you cannot read or write uh, to the cell after some point. In flash memory, uh, especially in scale technologies, uh, the number of writes you can do to a cell is on the order of a thousand or so. If you actually store more bits per cell, it goes down to a hundred or so. So it's a very serious problem, this endurance problem. DRAM doesn't have that endurance problem. Uh, these other memories have the endurance problem. This could be a reliability problem. It could be a security problem also, actually, because some attacker application can keep writing to memory, and you need to prevent that, uh, because otherwise the memory will not be available to other applications uh, that, that need the memory. Right? So this is a very interesting. Uh, so that's, that's one of the examples of uh, other demands that other technologies may place on the memory controller. DRAM does not have the problem. DRAM has the refresh problem more serious than other technologies. So basically, you need to design the controller uh, so that it can control the technology it's controlling. SRAM also has controllers, but SRAM controllers are simpler uh, today. And this is one example. This is a, a, an example of a flash memory control. I'm not going to go through the details of an SSD control. I'm going to point you to some papers. This is actually from one of the earlier papers that we did uh, in flash memory uh, about seven, eight years ago. Uh, Basically, uh, these are similar to DRAM controllers, except they're flash memory specific, clearly. You need to control the flash memory chips. And they do much more than a regular DRAM controller. As I said, it, they need to take care of the endurance issue, which is not written here. But uh, uh, flash memory has a hu huge error problem. So if you actually uh, have flash memory, a lot of the bits don't work <laughs> when it, whenever, whenever you get the memory out of the factory. So it's, it's really the memory controller that uses a lot of error correction to make the bits work. And these are very sophisticated error correction engines. If you're interested, uh, I'll have a, a survey paper that talks about error correction mechanisms in flash memory. That's not going to be fo the focus of this particular uh, lecture right now. But you can see that they not only do error correction, but they also do uh, page remapping, for example. Because whenever you uh, uh, write to a flash memory page, you need to actually uh, erase the page. So basically, you need to really uh, manage the pages. And, and whenever you erase the page, uh, you really need to, it, it takes a very long time uh, to erase the page. Uh, and to be able to do that, flash memory uh, controllers actually have pools of pages that are erased uh, that are ready to write to. And uh, to be able to do that, you need to actually have manage these pools somehow. Uh, uh, I mean, and this is also technology specific. Um, uh, the, re the reason you need to erase the page is really for cost reasons, and it's explained in the paper that I'm going to mention later on. Uh, but essentially, all these technologies have these idiosyncrasies, if you will, that you need to deal with whenever you're designing the controller. 
uh, also this controller needs to deal with the fact that uh, you have read commands and erase commands, and those erase commands take much, much longer than read commands. Uh, and the command latencies in flash memory is much longer than DRAM. DRAM is in the order of nanoseconds. Here, the order is like microseconds or so. And erase are actually 10 times or uh, 20 or 30 times more expensive than read commands that you have. And the reading procedure is also very different in flash memory. Uh, I have a lecture on flash memory uh, we, may, we may get to later on. But this is just to show you that this controller is much more sophisticated than a DRAM controller, actually. But uh, the upside is, because the latencies are long to access flash memory, it's maybe easier to design, actually, compared to a DRAM controller. Because DRAM controller, the latencies are very short. Nanosecond level, you need to make decisions much, much more quickly. You cannot afford sophisticated error correction mechanisms like you can afford over here, because here the latencies are much longer. OK, I gave you a very quick overview. I didn't do justice to all of these things that are written over here. But uh, if you're interested, uh, I'd recommend reading this paper, actually. This is, this is a paper that we wrote after like eight, eight or nine years of research in flash memory. It covers not only our work, but also the general work in the field on how flash memory uh, controllers actually work. Uh, and this is another view. This is a better picture than the previous picture that was drawn in 2012, actually. This is in 2019 or so. Uh, OK, so that's, that's the paper. Uh, and if you're really interested in SSD controllers, uh, these works actually show some of the state of the art. Uh, we released a simulator that essentially simulates modern SSD controllers. Not everything inside them, unfortunately, because it's uh, a lot of work to actually put them in. But it simulates the key scheduling uh, mechanisms over here. And also, the, this is uh, one example of uh, modern issues in flash memory controllers. Like, how do you actually, when, whenever you have multiple uh, streams, multiple applications sharing the flash memory control, you run into interference problems. And how do you actually solve those interference problems? This paper proposes one, po one potential solution uh, to that problem. Again, I'm not going to go through this in detail. If we have the flash memory lecture later on, uh, we may talk about this in more detail. Has anyone work, worked on flash memory controllers, SSD controllers here? No? OK. I think this is really fascinating, actually. There's a lot of research that goes, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it in the industry. Not a lot of research, actually. It's a good research area, but it's not an easy research area also. Uh, we did a lot of work together with uh, folks at Seagate, uh, for example, to actually get real data from flash memory devices. And uh, you, uh, this paper actually summarizes a lot of that real data from uh, flash memory devices. It's, it's fascinating. OK, so let me. Uh, finish the flash memory part. Let me jump to DRAM. Basically, DRAM is also very interesting. Uh, and one of the issues with DRAM is that it has different types with different interfaces optimized for different purposes. So you're designing a memory controller. What do you design a memory controller for, right? Do you design it for the commodity DRAM, DDR? And these all have differences, actually. These are protocols that are designed uh, by industry. And your, your, your memory controller needs to obey that standard to be able to work with a particular type of memory, DDR4, for example. And there are significant differences between each of these commodity technologies. So you, you cannot design the DDR3 controller that works for DDR4 control. You need to design a controller that actually takes into account both of those if you actually want your system to work with both of those chips. It's not an easy thing, actually. And low power has another interface. Uh, high bandwidth memory for graphics has another interface. Uh, low latency DRAM has some other interface. 3D stack DRAM has some other interface. So there's a huge proliferation of different types of DRAM. And there are others, actually. I will show you a picture, uh, again, in one slide that summarizes some of these technologies. Uh, the, the key thing to know is the underlying microarchitecture of the DRAM chip is actually the same. What we've covered yesterday, it's all two-dimensional arrays that are built hierarchically uh, up to the channels. The only thing, uh, well, the only thing, but the important thing that's different between these is really the interface. The specification, the data sheet that says, OK, these are the timing parameters that you need to obey, and th this is the timing parameter. And some of these have different timing parameters. And also, the other thing, I, sh I shouldn't say the only thing, there are two things that are different. One is the interface, and the other thing is the analog interface. One is the digital interface, and the other is the analog interface. And the analog interface is actually a big mess, because you really need to design a, a DRAM interface that works with the particular signaling technology these different memories have. And that's really the hardest part, actually. Designing the memory control is hard, not easy. But the signaling, analog signaling interface is actually one of the hardest parts. And that's really where, the, uh, where 
a lot of people don't have the ability to develop that analog interface. As a result, uh, if you really want to build your own chip, for example, open source hardware, you somehow need to get that analog interface from somewhere. I think that's one of the, today I think memory is the limiting factor in open source hardware, for example. You may know of the open source hardware efforts that are going on, like RISC-V. Building a processor is good. Building a memory controller is good. These are not easy things. But that analog interface between the memory and the processor, that's probably one of the hardest parts, especially if you want to operate things at very, very high frequency. So, so today DDR4 is operating at, I think, 2.6 gigahertz, maybe 3.2 gigahertz. I don't, even, I don't even know, actually. It keeps increasing. And that analog interface re needs to be really, really well done. And there are only a few companies that do it really well, I think, currently. And they sell that analog interface IP at very, very high uh, prices. So I think if, if, if people want to develop open source hardware, somebody needs to develop that open source analog interface, which is really the hardest part, in my opinion, in developing open source hardware. Or somebody needs to change the paradigm such that you don't need to rely on these analog interfaces. Uh, I mean, you need to have some analog interfaces, but this, this processor memory dichotomy makes it much harder, I think. OK, anyway, I, I, go, I digress. But this is very interesting, actually. So a flexible memory controller should support various, OK, I don't, I don't know why this is. Let me just make sure there are no other alarms. OK, good. This is for yesterday, so that <laughs> I, don't, I, I make sure I come to the lecture. <laughs> OK, uh, so a flexible memory control actually can support various DRAM types, but it's very difficult to design a memory control that can support all of these. Maybe you can design the logic, but again, analog interfaces, how do you actually have I don't know, let's assume that you want to support five of these. How do you actually have five different analog interfaces? that are off chip. It's not, as far as I know, it's just not possible. Well, if it's possible, you need to have a very expensive chip. So you, usually memory controllers support one type of memory, which is a bit sad, actually. Uh, but even supporting one, one type of memory actually is complicated. Uh, so if you want to support more than uh, one type, you complicate the memory controller. So it's difficult to support all types and upgrades. So you support some type of memory, for example. You design your processor such that it supports DDR4. And DDR5 comes out. And you didn't support it, what do you do? Well, your chip is already obsolete, right? Essentially. Somebody else, maybe a competitor, has designed for DDR5 and they take over. OK, so it's good to think about these issues. Uh, it's not just about the processor, it's really about the memory interface and what you support in your memory controller. And if you want to support hybrid memory, now you, by nature, you have to actually design two different memory controllers. And they somehow need to coordinate with each other, right? And I didn't even list phase change memory over here, for example. That is a different interface over here. Today, people want actually the same interface for phase change memory and uh, DRAM. But there needs to be some differences, uh, which we will not get into. We may get into that, actually, when we talk about non-volatile memory. OK, so this is one example of uh, the landscape of DRAM-based memory uh, that uh, uh, from, from one of our works, uh, the Ramulator work, which I will talk about later on. This is a flexible, uh, fast, and extensible DRAM simulator that we released. It's the state of the art in DRAM simulation. If you want to start on memory, I would suggest using this. It's used by companies. It's used by academia. And we support it heavily. Uh, we actually get a lot of bug reports from companies so that we update the simulator. Uh, but uh, this, uh, this was published in 2015. And this is the landscape of DRAM memory at that time. And these are the uh, standards that uh, RAM emulator supports. So you can see that 3D stack memories are increasing at that time. Uh, and uh, a lot of these are supported by Ramulator uh, right now. And there is also a bunch of academic proposals, which we will also talk about uh, when the time comes. So today, hopefully, we'll talk about Raider, for example. Uh, so the reason I'm showing you is that uh, the, the uh, DRAM types are proliferating today. There are different types. And if you want to actually uh, build a memory controller, you need to know what these different types are, what are the different characteristics. Uh, I'll talk about RAM later, later on. Uh, but one thing uh, that I will mention, we, uh, we have a paper coming up in Sigmetrics this year, 2019, that analyzes the interaction of different workloads with different types of memories. This study is very difficult to do in real life because, as I said, there's no machine that supports different memory controllers. So we had to use simulation. But we wanted to look at the effect of different types of memories on different type of workloads and what you should use for different workloads. Uh, so we did this simulation-based study, extensive simulation-based study. Uh, it's coming up in June, uh, at the end of June in Sigmetrics. If you're interested, I'd be happy to share the paper with you 
soon. It's not on my website yet. The abstract, I think, is on my website, but not the full paper. Uh, oh yeah, there's there's one on archive. Yes, yes, you you see you've seen it already. There's the one on archive, but it's not the latest copy. <laughs> so there's a better copy uh, with better results, better data. That's coming up uh, for the published version. Yeah, yeah. I, I find this fascinating. There's a lot more to do in this area because we don't. Uh, I think we found some interesting results. For example, you would think going from DDR3 to DDR4 would improve performance, right? But it doesn't in many workloads. You actually lose performance in many workloads. Why? Because DDR4, even though it improves bandwidth, it increases the latency of accesses. And many workloads are latency sensitive. So sometimes <laughs> processor manufacturers don't necessarily make the best decisions in terms of, uh, sorry, the DM manufacturers don't make the best decisions, or DM industry in general doesn't necessarily make the best decisions for latency in general, as we've seen yesterday. So, OK. So it's good to do these studies. So let's talk about DRM controllers. Let's assume that you picked one type of memory and you want to support that in your DRM controller. What do you support? What are the functions of a DRM controller? First of all, the key function is that you need to ensure correct operation of DRM, right? You need to ensure that you obey the refresh and the timing parameters that are specified by the data sheets. You would think this is easy, but it's not that easy, actually, especially with the other constraints, because there's so many parameters. Uh, on top of this, you need to service DRM requests while obeying timing constraints of DRM chips. This is also ensuring correct operation, but there are other constraints, not just refresh and timing, but also resource conflicts. You need to keep track of the banks. You need to keep track of the bus. You need to keep track of the channel. You need to keep track of all of the timing constraints. One example is minimum read, write to read delays. So uh, DRM, for example, uh, whenever you're writing to a rank, you cannot read from that rank in, today, in today's systems. The reason is bus is one directional, and you can only uh, go one direction on the bus, you, cannot, you need to basically switch the bus, turn around the bus driver. And that leads to some extra delay whenever you're switching from read to write. So you can only do reads or writes at a given time. Um, as a result, memory controllers try to optimize this. Basically what they do is they batch the writes to memory and they wait until some number of writes are accumulated. And um, after some number of writes or some fraction of, uh, some fraction of the write queue is full, they basically flush the writes into memory. And during the time you're flushing the writes into memory, you cannot do reads from that particular rank where you're flushing the writes to. So these are the issues we may, you may not have thought of perhaps in the past, but it's, it's, it's a real thing that you need to deal with. Uh, okay, of course, to, to be able to deal with, you need to develop algorithms to, you, you cannot, uh, uh, this is actually very important. Uh, we have a paper on this that I will probably reference in a little bit. Um, if you don't batch the writes, uh, if you say, if you basically service a write whenever the write comes, you basically incur a lot of these write to read switching penalties. There's a write to read delay and read to write delay that you need to wait before you can actually issue a read or write. And if you actually don't batch the writes, you incur these delays too much and you lose a lot of performance in the system. So how many of you knew about this write to read delays in the app? Okay, some of you did, yeah. But this is actually a big thing, if you, especially if your workload is write intensive. Okay, so you need to translate requests to DRM command sequences. So this is actually something important to do. Uh, you get a request to a memory address, a read request, you need to change that to command sequences. Pre-charge, uh, activate, read or write. You need to buffer and schedule requests for high performance and quality of service. It's a mouthful, but these are important basically. Basically you need to do the reordering, row buffer management, bank, rank, bus management, uh, so that you get high performance. Or, uh, and satisfy some quality of service. And as we discussed yesterday, this may not be easy to do because there are many different agents that are requesting uh, data from the memory controller or that are writing or reading uh, GPUs, CPUs, hardware accelerators. You need to manage all of them essentially. And on top of this, you need to manage power consumption and thermals in DRAM. This is becoming even more important going into the future. You need to turn on and off DRAM chips, manage the different power modes. DRAM chips have some power modes I will show you very briefly example, it's not actually, it's very crude right now. I think this is going to become much more uh, fine grained into the future because as power becomes a bigger issue in DRAM, especially with 3D stack technologies. With 3D stacking, you have a logic layer underneath memory layers and heat has nowhere to escape really. As a result, thermals will become even more important and managing the power and thermals will become even more important for the memory controller. So we will see more power modes in DRAM. Today we have some crude power modes. Even then you need to manage the crude power modes because uh, for example, this is, right now, it's, it's the memory of this is in self-refresh mode. It's the lowest power mode that I can get 
while keeping the DRAM data alive in this. Self-refresh means memory control just issues self-refresh commands. That's it. Uh, uh, but to be able to uh, access memory in this mode, getting out of that mode takes, a, takes some time because you need to power up the uh, access circuitry uh, and get out of that mode. Which means that if you actually went into self-refresh mode too early, you may delay the requests that are important uh, because you need to get out of that mode at, uh, when a request comes. So there's a lot of things that you need to manage over here. And this is one example of a DRAM controller. Again, this doesn't do justice to all of the functions that I just mentioned, but uh, a modern DRAM controller essentially has some queues. Uh, it could be per bank queues, it could be joint queues across banks, uh, and there are some arbiters. We'll, we'll talk about some of these. It basically gets the transactions or requests. It does some tra address translation to figure out which bank, which rank, which channel uh, it go, uh, the request goes to, and then it breaks things down into commands, and then it does the command scheduling and reordering. And this is a signaling, electrical signaling analog interface that I mentioned, that it also needs to deal with that uh, interface. And it also sometimes needs to do the calibration of that interface, which we will not talk about. But it's a mess. <laughs> okay. Um, this is another picture from one of my earlier papers, basically, an another uh, view of the DRAM controller. Basically, you get requests, and this is just in a multi core system. You get requests from different caches, and then uh, you have some interconnect to route them to different bank request buffers. In this case, request buffers are partitioned across banks. They don't have to be the case, but in most modern memory controllers, they're partitioned across banks. Uh, and then each bank is a scheduler uh, that is independent of the other banks. And then there's a global scheduler that decides which banks request to pick. And of course, there are other functions over here like refresh that need to be coordinated uh, either globally or per bank depending on how you do the refresh. Okay, so if you're interested in some scheduling algorithms, this one example, I'm gonna give you the reference to the paper. We're not gonna talk about the quality of service as much in this lecture. If we have time, we'll get to it next week. Okay, but let's talk about some simple scheduling policies. First come, first serve, oldest request that is received is served first. This is really not a scheduling policy in my opinion because you do whatever you're given, right? <laughs> Without actually changing the ordering. Uh, but this used to be the controllers in the past. Uh, over time, people figured out that this row buffer hits that we talked about are important. If you actually prioritize row buffer uh, requests that go to the row that's already open, they can maximize the DRAM throughput, DRAM bandwidth. So they developed this first ready, first come, first serve policy or row buffer hit first policy that essentially prioritize the request in the request buffer. And if, it's, uh, if the request is to a, a, a row that's already open, it gets higher priority over other requests. And all else being equal, all the requests get higher priority. That's the FCFS principle over here. So the goal here is clearly to maximize the row buffer hit rate, which maximizes the DRAM throughput, which minimizes the overall latency, because you're really trying to uh, serve those requests with lowest latency possible, uh, considering the row buffer. But of course, as you, as you can see, this doesn't, we didn't even talk about writes here. You need to actually incorporate the write scheduling also over here, write to read uh, turnarounds. Uh, so the, so the policy is really so more sophisticated. Uh, I mean, as I said, the scheduling is done at the command level. You have column commands, read or write, prioritize over row commands, activate and pre-charge. This is something to think about. You're, you're really not scheduling requests, you're really scheduling commands. But there are different schedulers that do it differently. Sometimes they schedule requests, but at some point they need to translate the request to the commands. So where do you do the scheduling is another question, which again, I will not go into. Uh, but usually the high performance schedulers schedule commands, reorder the commands uh, compared to each other. Within each group, older commands are prioritized over younger ones, essentially. That's the FRFCFS uh, scheduler. Okay, I think I'm gonna go through this quickly. This is just to jog your memory. This is a picture that we showed yesterday. Uh, row zero is open. Now if the next request is the same row, you get a row buffer hit, and that's very quick because you just need to send the read uh, command and mucks out the data, right? If the next request is the same row, we get a row buffer hit, and that's fast. If the next request is to some different row, you get a row buffer conflict, and that's really slow, right? You need to act, pre charge, activate, and read. Okay, so you already know this, that's why, but this is to jog your memory that there is a big difference between a row buffer conflict and a row buffer hit. So a scheduling policy is really a prioritization order in the end. You have some requests or commands and you want to prioritize them. This prioritization can be based on many, many things. In current systems, they're based on simple heuristics plus some quality of service heuristics. But request age is one of them. Row buffer hit miss status. Request type could be one of them. Is it a prefetch? Is it a read? Is it a write? 
uh, requester type could be another one of them. Is this a request coming from a load miss or a store miss? Because these are actually have different implications on processor performance, right? Load miss is bringing in some data that's needed immediately because you're going to use that register for something, uh, um, some dependent operation. Store miss, that may not be true, right? You may not actually need that data because you're storing something into memory. So these have different implications on performance. Request criticality, however you define it, how critical a request is. Is it really a request that's uh, satisfying the oldest miss in the core? Because modern processor can generate many, many requests, let's say 16 requests, outstanding requests to memory, and you received uh, 15 of them, let's say. Uh, so which one do you prioritize? Maybe the oldest miss in the core is more important, right? How many instructions in the core are dependent on it? This is, of course, harder information to get, uh, especially to the memory controller. But even in the core itself, it's, very, it's hard information to uh, keep track of. Will it stall the processor? Can you guess that? I don't know. Uh, not always. So this is actually, uh, these are some considerations that you can uh, put into the memory controller. There's also another uh, issue, which is the interference caused to other cores. Uh, so this schedule may be important. Uh, this uh, this uh, particular uh, request may be important to not schedule, because if you schedule it, it will cause a lot of interference to some other core, right? So these are issues that are actually hard to deal with. They're all dynamic scheduling issues. There are many other issues like this. Uh, the question is, how do you do the prioritization? Right? Okay, let me talk about uh, robot for management policies a little bit. Uh, we'll get back to the interference issue a little bit later again. So uh, what do you do with the robuffer is also important, right? Uh, after you get an access to a robuffer, uh, do you keep the row open for some time? Uh, this is the open row policy. You keep the row open after an access. Well, why, this, why could this be good? Because the next access might need the same row, so you'll get a row hit. But if you keep the row open too long, it may not be good because next access might need a different row. Next access to the same bank might need a different row. In this case, if you kept the, open, uh, kept the row open, you would get a row conflict, and that request needs to pay the penalty of that row conflict to be serviced. Right? Basically, you're delaying the next request in this case. Not only that, you're also wasting energy. Because while you're keeping the row buffer open, that's, uh, the row buffer is in active state, meaning that the cells are connected to the sense amplifiers, so you really have a feedback loop in the circuit that's really wasting a lot of power. If you kept the row buffer closed, you would cut that feedback loop and uh, the sense amplifiers would not be active. So you would actually save power. So in this case, you waste energy and power. Okay, the closed row policy is exact opposite. Basically, whenever uh, you, you do an access to a row, you close the row after the access. Of course, there's a smarter version of this. If no other requests are already in the request buffer uh, that are needing the same row. I think this is the smarter closed row policy. If you close it after every access, then you may have a problem because there may already be a request that's waiting for that row in the request buffer. So the upside of this is if the next access needs a different row, you avoid a row conflict. That's great. You by, uh, by pro proactively closing the row. Uh, that way, uh, when you, once you close the row, uh, the next access just needs to do an, uh, do an activate. It doesn't incur the pre-charge latency. Right? But if the next access needs the same row, then you close the row too, too early. Uh, now you incur an extra, extra activate latency. That's unfortunate. So uh, it, more adaptive policies that are employed in most processors today predict or try to predict in some way uh, whether or not the next access to the bank will be to the same row and they try to act accordingly. So there are some prediction mechanisms that are really simple. Uh, they're not perfect, but they try to uh, decide whether to keep the ro row open or closed. And they try to balance performance and energy. If you keep the row open for too long, then you actually lose energy as we discussed, right? Okay. This is again, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but basically this shows with a given policy, if you have this first access and the next access, what are the commands needed for the next access? So if you have an open row policy, if the first access is to row zero, if the next access is to row one, then you need to do a pre-charge, activate row one and read uh, for the next access, right? For closed row policy, you essentially have something different, right? If, the, if you have a closed row policy, uh, yeah, basically you do something different. Anyway, you can go through this on your own. Any questions so far? Okay, so DM chips, as I said, have power modes. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but the key idea is when you're not accessing a chip, you power it down. 
The question is, of course, when do you enter a power down mode? This, I think an open or, or closed row policy is one example. When do you close a row is one example of the power down mode. And these are the power states, actually. Active is the highest power. Uh, all banks idle is um, another power state uh, where you don't have any rows that are open in any bank, basically. You're not wasting a lot of power. You don't need to supply power to all of the banks. There is a, a further power down state that powers down some other circuitry in DRAM. And finally, the self-refresh is the lowest power state, basically. The DRAM is in self-refresh mode. It's refreshing itself. And the memory controller needs to interrupt it to get out of this mode to some active mode, for example. So basically, there's a trade-off. This is lowest power. This is highest power. And there are intermediate states in between. But state transitions incur latency during which the chip cannot be accessed. So going out of self-refresh actually takes, I believe right now, microseconds. Uh, you should, need, you should t take a look at the uh, data sheet, of course. But you need to wait a lot, basically, to get out of self-refresh. So if you preemptively went into self-refresh too early, you lose a lot of performance. And you may actually not save a lot of power also because you're going to get back, get out of that self-refresh quickly. So only in times of low, long idleness, you go into self-refresh. And all banks idle, basically, you turn off all of the row buffers uh, in, in the banks. Uh, again, that's a, it's a power performance trade-off that you need to do. And as I said, uh, if you have 3D stacking, now you have uh, not only these uh, states, but you also have uh, a temp temperature to manage and power becomes more important because, as I said, heat has nowhere to escape and you have some thermal profile in your 3D stacking. Uh, you may actually have some parts of the DRAM that may be too hot. Right? And too hot is not good for multiple reasons. One is you could have reliability issues. Uh, you may need to refresh more often. As we will see at high temperatures, the DRAM becomes much more leaky and you will need to refresh more often. Uh, and also you may have other uh, uh, basically, you, 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 you lose uh, power, right? Uh, your energy efficiency goes down if you actually have high temperatures. Okay, so I, we're not going to talk about the 3D stacking, but that's also uh, important. Any questions? Yes, please. So what's the difference between the on-bank idle and power down? So there are some uh, additional uh, circuitry. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. They basically clock gate to a lot of peripheral circuitry. Uh, uh, but of course, whenever you need to access uh, DRAM again, you need to turn that on, and that takes time. So that's the major difference. Yeah. Basically, progressively, uh, if you go from active to self-refresh, you turn off more circuitry. Yeah, there's some power gating that they also do internally. So they don't exactly tell exactly what they do actually in the power down state, but as far as we know, it's more circuitry is turned off. That's peripheral circuitry. But even in self-refresh, actually, there's some peripheral circuitry that's on and that's leaking. <laughs> because you, uh, if you totally power everything off, then you lose data, right? <laughs> okay. Any, any other questions? Okay. If you're interested in this topic, I can uh, point you to some papers uh, that are related. Uh, but I think, uh, for, in my opinion, this, this whole area needs to be revisited uh, a little bit more when we actually have more, uh, more different types of memories because I don't think this is a very good granularity of managing power in today's systems. If you co-design the controller and the memory together, you can actually do more in this case. But right now, it's DM manufacturers are designing the power mode, somebody else is designing the memory controller, and they don't communicate as much with each other. Okay, so let's talk about difficulty of DRAM control a little bit uh, because I think this is something that uh, we need to tackle even more going forward with any memory technology. Uh, so why are DRAM controllers difficult to design? You need to obey DRAM timing constraints, and there are many timing constraints in DRAM. 50 plus is an understatement. Actually, if you take a data sheet, you will see more than 100, 120 timing constraints. And so, uh, as we discussed, TWTR is one example. Minimum number of cycles to wait before issuing a read command after a write command is issued. And the scope of this, as I said, is the scope of a rank. So uh, meaning that this, this timing constraint should be enforced at the rank level. TRC should be enforced at the bank level. Uh, it's the minimum number of cycles between the issuing of two consecutive activate commands to the same bank. TRC is row cycling time. This is really how people measure latency for a long time. Basically, how many consecutive, uh, what is the latency between two consecutive activates to two different rows? And there are many others that we will see in, a, in the next few slides. 
You need to keep track of many resources to prevent conflicts, as we discussed. Uh, you need to handle the ERM refresh on top of that. You need to manage power consumption. And you need to optimize performance and quality of service in the presence of all of these constraints. And reordering is not simple. People have tried to reduce reordering. Uh, for example, GPU memory controllers actually have a lot of request buffers. And memory controller power is a concern in GPUs because they send a lot of requests to memory. They try to minimize the reordering that they do. They try to keep the memory controllers as simple as possible. Like they, ideally, they want first come, first serve, actually. No scheduling, no reordering. Because reordering is not simple, it take, it, it, it's, it's more effort and more power. And fairness and quality of service clearly complicates the scheduling problem, actually. So these are some latencies. Uh, let me see if this is the best place to show. This is actually the paper uh, that I wanted to mention. This is actually proposing a mechanism to reduce this write to read and read to write turnaround delays. And the idea, actually, is uh, very simple. Uh, I like this idea. That's why I wanted to uh, mention it. But basically, uh, if, if you want to minimize the uh, number of times you switch between reads and writes in DRAM, ideally, what you would like to do is to send the writes from the cache to DRAM in a batch. Right? But this is not happening in today's caches. So in today's caches, whenever you send, uh, so what is a write request going to DRAM? It's really a write back from the cache. right? Otherwise, you don't have a write request uh, going to DRAM. You normally have read requests to fill the cache. Uh, so these write-back requests today happen based on evictions into the cache. And these evictions are more or less random. Of course, it depends on the access pattern. So the idea in this paper says whenever you're evicting a cache block uh, that goes to a particular row in DRAM, search your cache and find other cache blocks that are dirty that go to the same row in DRAM and evict them at the same time. This basically batches the evictions of uh, uh, cache blocks to the same row, and it basically sends a nice stream to the memory controller. Then the memory controller can now schedule those requests, and it, it will get row hits uh, in all of those writes. So that's one of the ideas. And this is an example of coordinating the last level cache replacement policy and the memory controller scheduling policy. If you co-design those two policies together, you get much better performance. Of course, how do you implement it? You, you should look at the paper because there are various ways of implementing it. Some of them are extremely costly. Some of them are not so costly. OK, uh, so ba basically this paper tries to tackle the right to read delays. As you can see, it's 6 DRAM cycles. It's not, a lot, it's not little in the DDR3-1600. There is also a read to write, uh, yeah, activate to read write delay. You can see that different delays. OK, there, there are interesting things that you need to satisfy. For example, there's this four activate windows. The, the reason for this is uh, basically how many uh, uh, cycles do you need to uh, wait before you actually need to, uh, okay, I, I messed it up basically. So uh, you, can, you can have four activations uh, in, in, in parallel going on in the DRAM because there's a power constraint in DRAM. And you need to wait for some number of cycles before you issue the next activations. And uh, this is to manage the power in DRAM. Again, this is specified by the manufacturers that don't want to deal with very high power. And you need to, the memory control needs to obey a constraint like this, right? It's not great, but this is what you need to do. OK, so if you really want to know uh, the DRAM timing constraints, these two papers explain it really well. Uh, I, I mentioned that already. For example, uh, you can see that uh, you send an activate. There's an activate to read delay. That's TRCD. That's specified by the DRAM standard. It's 15 nanoseconds. There's an activate uh, to pre-charge delay, as you can see over here. That's specified as TRAS. There's an activate to activate delay that's specified as TRC over here. And there are different delays. Uh, there's TCL, for example, how long it takes uh, to get the cache line out. And there's timing parameters associated with it. There's TBL, the bus latency, uh, or burst length, how long it takes to get a data burst. And these are all specified in the D particular DRAM data sheet, DRAM standard. And these are some of the more fundamental parameters over here. OK, this is another example over here. This is actually from the sub-area level parallelism paper. This uh, does a more methodical treatment. Basically, it gives you the timing parameter. It gives you the commands uh, that are affected. It gives you the scope. Like, do you need to enforce the timing parameter at the bank level, channel level, rank level? And you have all types of parameters. Uh, for example, this is enforced at the channel level. And again, these timing constraints are there to make sure that DRAM gets enough time to stabilize, uh, to give you the correct data. Uh, for example, uh, this is the pre-charge state. You send an activate command. 
uh, activate command, uh, activates the word line, and it essentially takes some time uh, to, uh, for the word line to be activated and the cells on the word line to share data, share charge with their bit lines. And after some time, the sense amplifier gets ac activated over here. And after some time, the sense amplifier senses the charge and uh, drives uh, the bit line. Uh, it basically says, okay, I, I sensed a one over here, I sensed a zero. And at this point, you can start reading or writing. So basically, this is the activate to read delay, right? Uh, and after some point, the sense amplifier becomes completely stable. Uh, at that point, you can now issue a precharge because the sense amplifier completely restored the charge in the cells. So basically, the time you can issue a read is different from the time you can issue a precharge uh, because the sense amplifier has the correct data and can supply the correct data when you issue a read over here, but the cells don't have their data restored yet because it takes time to restore the cells. And it takes, uh, after that time passes, the cells have the data restored. Now you can actually pre-charge the array so that uh, uh, you, can, you can correctly operate, you can correctly store the data. So the reason you have these parameters is because of the way DRAM operates internally. And uh, uh, the manufacturers specify different parameters so that you can actually schedule a read early uh, at this point uh, as opposed to waiting until this point. Does that make sense? It's really an optimization in the end. This, doesn't need, this doesn't need to be the case. You can actually have a single timing parameter to DRAM, right? Whatever operation you're doing, you wait for n cycles. That's, a, that's again, synchronous DRAM. You wait for n cycles. But you need to, of course, ensure that you can wait for the maximum number of cycles to make sure that any operation completes. Now, there's a downside to that because uh, if you're actually doing an activate, you don't need to wait for 50 cycles, right, uh, to, is uh, to issue a read. To issue the next activate, you need to wait for 50 cycles. So this is uh, the choice in the interface. Uh, they, uh, this gives a lot of freedom to the memory controller to optimize uh, the requests, the command scheduling, but it makes the memory controller complicated also. So there's another interface that's possible. This is a synchronous interface, clearly, right? This is basically the memory controller knows how much time it should wait uh, until it, it issues some other command based on the previous command it issued. But this has not always been the case in DRAM. This is synchronous DRAM. In the past, there used to be asynchronous DRAM. And I like the asynchronous interface actually much better. We should probably go going to asynchronous interface going into the future. Here, the memory control is very tightly coupled with the DRAM. There is some interface that's specified and you, you really need to obey all of these to make sure it works. But some other interface would be this, right? The memory controller basically issues a command to DRAM and it waits for an acknowledgement, right? So it's not based on any of these timings. The memory control doesn't need to know any timing. Internally, the DRAM handles the command scheduling and everything and basically responds to the memory controller with ACK or NAC, uh, uh, essentially a handshake protocol. And I like that protocol much better because this ensures that the memory controller is not dealing with all of these nitty gritty. There is a memory controller that's dealing with all of this nitty gritty, but it's really on the DRAM side. So it's really an intelligent memory controller that's sitting on the DRAM side. This is a really dumb memory control that's basically obeying what the DRAM manufacturers tell. But the other memory control enables other things also, right? Basically, you can now send a function to the DRAM saying, DRAM, do this addition for me inside. And the memory controller, processor side, doesn't need to think about anything. Internally, the, the intelligent memory controller on the DRAM side handles all of the scheduling plus the addition. Right? And then returns the data back or returns an acknowledgement or ne a negative acknowledgement saying, I cannot do the operation for whatever reason, right? So that's a completely different interface. But today we're stuck with this interface, unfortunately. And going forward, in my opinion, there will be a lot of changes to this interface if the industry changes its mindset a little bit. Okay, any questions? I spend more time than I expected over here, but this is a fascinating topic, so. And I think the, the key takeaway, the high level key takeaway is, uh, Really, this is an interface that you need to deal with at this point, but we need to rethink the interfaces. Okay, this is another example paper. Uh, we'll, we're going to talk about some of these papers later on, but that, uh, these are actually clearly describe why these timing parameters exist. If you actually go into a DRAM data sheet, they will not tell you why these timing parameters exist. They say, here are the timing parameters, deal with it. Because if you don't deal with it, you may not actually operate DRAM correctly. Right? So as I said, this uh, memory controller design is becoming more difficult. Uh, I showed you this picture before. You have 
different agents, different constraints, different memory types, and many goals at the same time. So how do you design these memory controllers? Uh, so let, uh, I'll give you some of the research that we've done early on, uh, not solving this problem. I think this problem is actually much more complicated, but uh, trying to solve the memory scheduling problem in, a, uh, in some different way. Uh, and, the, and the reality is that uh, it's actually difficult to design a policy that maximizes performance, quality of service, and efficiency. There are too many things to think about. And continuously uh, you need to adapt to continuously changing workload and system behavior. Usually, when humans design policies, they come up with very fixed policies, like FCFS, FRFCFS, right? They're very, very simple policies, or write-to-read scheduling policies that are batch-based. They're very simple policies. They don't, they're not necessarily the best when the workload changes and when system behavior changes. I have a story about this, actually. I, uh, I used to work at Microsoft Research. Uh, does anybody know the name Chuck Tacker here? Yeah, Chuck Tacker is a Turing Award winner. He did a lot of early work on system design. The Alto system, for example, Xerox Alto system. Uh, basically, computing platforms, PCs, pro, uh, personal computers as we know them, uh, was designed by he and his team a long time ago. And uh, he was also designing the DDR3 controller uh, in 2008, 2009 or so for an FPGA board. Uh, and he was saying that was the worst thing he designed in his life. <laughs> so he did all the early work in PCs. And when it came to the DDR3 controller, he was really annoyed. <laughs> And I, can, I empathize with the annoyance, actually. This is really some of the re really hardest parts of the system to design, in my opinion, especially if you need to deal with the analog. But even if you don't deal with the analog, this, is, uh, this can drive you crazy. So OK, our dream at that time, uh, while he was concurrently working on the DDR3 controller, we were actually doing some other stuff like this. Uh, we were dreaming, basically. Wouldn't it be nice if the DRM controller automatically did all of this, found a good scheduling policy on its own? And this is machine learning before machine learning became uh, big in a sense, right? So th this is uh, work we published at ISCA. I'm going to give you the high level overview. No, I'm not going to go into the details of it a lot. Yes? So I mean, you can use any hardware language, mm -hmm. uh, certainly. But whenever people design memory controllers today, they just use Verilog. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's very low level, basically. But I've seen memory controls that are written in more higher level uh, languages like BlueSpec. Uh, you're familiar with that probably, right? Yeah. Uh, but again, if you really want to meet timing, sometimes it's hard to do it with higher level languages. Yeah. OK, so uh, essentially, uh, the problem we targeted was DRM controls are difficult to design. And we said it's difficult for human designers to design a policy that can adapt itself very well to different workloads and different system conditions. Uh, and our idea was to have a memory control that adapts its scheduling policy to workload behavior and system conditions using machine learning. Uh, and the observation we had was, of course, machine learning is very broad, right? There are many, many machine learning algorithms. The observation we had in this case was nice. We, fig uh, we found out that the reinforcement learning maps nicely to memory control. Because memory controller is really can be modeled as a Markov decision process. Basically, it's really, uh, it's really at a given state, it's taking an action and that's moving it to some other state. Essentially, that's a Markov decision process, and with some probability, it's choosing different actions. Right. Uh, basically, our uh, design was to uh, design the memory controller as a reinforcement learning agent that can dynamically and continuously learn uh, and employ the best scheduling policy, best scheduling policy to maximize long-term performance. So, what's the reinforcement learning? This is the classic textbook picture of reinforcement learning. Actually, all of us are reinforcement learning agents, humans, right? Uh, you know about Paolo's dogs? You want Paolo's dogs? Essentially, those are reinforcement learning agents, right? These are the, the roots of reinforcement learning are in really psychology and biology. Basically, um, a reinforcement learning agent observes uh, the state of its environment. It takes an action, and it gets a reward. And that reward reinforces the action in the future or uh, de-reinforces the action, depending on whether or not you get the reward right. So you basically learn, um, you associate state action pairs with particular rewards. And in the future, you see that state. Uh, you, 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 whenever you see a state, you basically consider all of the possible actions that you can do in that state. And you choose the action that maximizes your reward. You can choose to maximize your immediate reward. Or you can choose to maximize your long-term reward somehow. This really depends on how you train the agent. So for example, the agent may immediately choose an action, and it knows that immediately it's going to get a reward. 
But this may not be actually uh, a good long-term action to choose because the long-term reward might be completely different. Right? So that's the idea over here. So uh, we model the memory controller, in this case, like this. The scheduler observes the state of the system, where we're going to see the state attributes. Uh, the, uh, and you, you can actually design what kind of state attributes it observes. Uh, it basically takes an action. In this case, the action is the command that it schedules. And the reward it gets in this part, the reward function is important, of course, if you want to, uh, depends on what you're trying to optimize. In our case, we wanted to optimize the data bus utilization, maximize the data bus utilization. That may not be the best option. It's, it's the best option if, if your goal is that, basically, uh, if your performance correlates with that. But this, this is not the case if you're uh, providing quality of service, for example, as we will see. So that's the idea, basically. Uh, essentially, the, treat the memory scheduler as a reinforcement learning agent that observes state action pairs, learns from them, and tries to maximize the long-term data bus utilization. And uh, I'm not going to go through this, but this is basically the uh, reward function. Basically, the, uh, this is how you train uh, the scheduler such that it, it learns to maximize this particular reward function. So this is the immediate reward, and then the next cycle's reward, next cycle's reward, next cycle's reward, weighted by some, some amount. So you, you basically have a long-term outlook into the rewards. You don't try to maximize the immediate reward. Okay. And then you keep training based on this. OK, so if you're, if you're really interested in learning about reinforcement learning, there's uh, uh, Rich Sutton uh, has, a, has a book, actually, on reinforcement learning that I would definitely recommend. Uh, the, the latest version was released, I think, last year. It, it, it contains some new, new applications. And he also discusses the scheduler as a, a good application of reinforcement learning in his book. OK, uh, so basically, uh, the idea is to dynamically adapt the memory scheduling policy with interaction with the system at the runtime, right? So we associate system states and actions with long-term reward values. Each action at a given state leads to a learned reward. And when you're taking a decision, you schedule the command with the highest estimated long-term reward value in a given state. And you continuously update reward values for state action pairs based on feedback from the system. Of course, to be able to do that, you need to have some tables, right? And I'm not going to go through the tables. Uh, essentially, we use a particular learning algorithm called Q-learning in this case. And you need to have a table. Uh, and you need to make sure that you can actually do, right, do the good decisions uh, uh, by, by storing things well in that table. But I'm not going to go through that in detail. OK, and if you're interested, you can read the paper. But this is what the scheduler does. It observes state. It takes an action. It gets a reward. And it updates uh, the table. Uh, that is not shown over here. So uh, the key things to choose, of course, over here are uh, th at, at least three things. One is the reward function, state attributes, and the actions. We chose the reward function to be like this. You basically get a positive reward for scheduling read and write commands because those utilize the data bus. You get no reward if you don't utilize the data bus. And the goal is to maximize long-term data bus utilization. Again, as I said, this may not be the metric that you want to optimize for, but this is something that we wanted to do because we didn't know anything else uh, at that point in time. We wanted to design this controller to be simple to begin with. And later, work built on our work to change the reward function to quality of service, for example, in fairness. Uh, so state attributes is also important. This is actually where the hard work goes into from, from the designer's perspective. Designer needs to specify these. Uh, the good thing is designer doesn't need to specify the policy. Right? The policy is learned by the agent, but designer needs to input the state attributes. And to get the state attributes, what we did was a feature selection process. Basically, we came up with, I think, more than 300 state attributes that a memory controller can potentially examine in a chip. And we basically input that to uh, a simulation infrastructure that simulated the controller. And we figured out uh, the top five or six state attributes that maximize the performance uh, in, uh, in simulation. And these were number of reads, number of writes, number of load misses in the transaction queue, number of pending writes. Uh, and reorder buffer heads waiting for a reference row. So this is, you, have a, you have an open row in a bank, and we basically count the number of pending writes to that bank. This turns out to correlate with, uh, 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 this turns out, it, it, uh, it, taking this into account as a state attribute would enable the reinforcement learning controller to make decisions that would lead to good performance, essentially. We don't know exactly why, because this is black box. I mean, you can guess why this could be the case, but you can never know exactly why this is the case, right? Because it's a learning agent that's really operating. That's always the downside with machine learning. It's a black box that's operating on itself. Uh, reorder buffer heads meaning means uh, this is the oldest instruction in the window uh, waiting for a row that's open. 
and this is a multi-core system. Uh, we count the number of uh, all distance instruction in the window waiting for their FSO. So you can guess why this is important, right? This particular uh, request to that row is blocking multiple uh, of these cores at this point. So maybe it's a good idea to schedule that. And then the request relative reorder buffer order, meaning that uh, uh, this particular request, uh, which instructions is it associated with? How old is that instruction relative to other instructions in its core? So again, this turns out to have an effect on the performance of the reinforcement learning scheduler because it gives an indication of how important potentially this request is to the core. Right? So again, you can guess what these is. Uh, but the creativity of the designer now needs to shift here. The designer needs to consider a lot of pot potential state attributes that could be useful for the controller. And actions are, actions are easier. Basically, activate, write, read. Uh, and we, we actually uh, had different actions for read, uh, for loads and stores. We wanted to distinguish between them and pre-charge and a preemptive pre-charge also. Pre-charge pending uh, uh, um, means that uh, there, there is a need for a pre-charge because a request uh, needs to open some other row in the same bank and pre-charge preemptive. There's no need for pre-charge, but you can preemptively issue a pre-charge because you can learn to close a row because you can learn that somebody else is going to open that row in the future, right? If you're looking at the role long term. This is very, very hard to do with predictive policies. People try to do it, but it's not easy. And no-op is also an action. And of course, on top of this, you need to ensure that refreshes are scheduled because refreshes, you don't want refreshes uh, to be learned because you may lose data initially until you learn them. Uh, and also, you need to make sure that, uh, yeah, but basically some correctness issues are obeyed, but they're, they're in the paper. So what is this? by you, essentially. Uh, I think we did a design. Our design was good. Uh, it's not bad. Uh, but essentially, uh, the takeaway is it, it provides large and robust performance improvements over many human design policies. We looked at many human design policies that are based on heuristics. Uh, uh, we actually did uh, a combinational. Uh, mm, essentially, we, we, we looked at the same state attributes our memory controller looked at, and we ordered them in some static order that a, as a human would do. And we look at all possible combinations of those policies. And this outperforms all of those policies in the end. And you can see that overall, it gives you about 20% higher performance, which is not possible to get uh, with the baseline scheduling policies. But I think this is going to be more important going into the future. As I said, the problem is going to increase. Okay. Any questions? Do people like this idea? I really like this sort of design. I'm going to broaden this topic a little bit, actually. So, of course, with any idea, this has upsides and downsides, right? Upside is you get continuous learning in the presence of a changing environment. You can adapt to different conditions. And we show in the paper that this is really important. It's very hard to design a policy that can adapt uh, to different conditions as a human. Now we reduce the designer burden. That's what we argued. Because you don't need to find a good scheduling policy. You just need to specify what system variables might be useful. And there's a feature automated feature selection process that selects the state attributes. And you just need to choose the reward function, basically. What is the target to optimize? But not, you don't need to figure out how to optimize that target. So as long as you have a good target and a good reward function uh, and good state attributes, hopefully this works. Of course, uh, the difficulty comes in exactly what I said. Basically, how do you specify these different objectives? What are the different reward functions? There are some works that are building on this work trying to input fairness and quality of service. And they show that actually it's not that hard which is good, but they don't solve the entire problem because there's a lot more uh, objectives in memory controller design. Hardware complexity is always an issue. We showed that you need a 32 kilobyte table in the memory controller. I'm not as concerned about this because I think going forward, memory controllers need to, uh, the mindset is that memory control should not be complex. But I think that mindset should change as memory controllers become more of the center of the world, right? If, if you really want to do computation inside there, you cannot avoid uh, putting complexity there. Okay, and I think the, uh, the other hard thing to ado uh, for adoption for this sort of ideas is design mindset as flow. Uh, usually, at least the hardware design mindset and flow today doesn't take into account these algorithms that are uh, not easy to reason about uh, from the hardware designer's perspective. Hardware designers are much more likely to implement an algorithm that they can easily test. Right? With FRFCFS, row hit first policy, they can easily construct test cases and they know what outcome they would get. Right? So testing becomes harder in this case because you don't know what outcome you would get in this case. right? <laughs> because if, if we actually tried hard to figure out what the controller is doing, it's not that easy. 
at any given point in time, you can take a snapshot of the state, you can form a decision tree of the decisions, but again, that decision tree doesn't give you a lot of insight into why the controller is doing things, because I think fundamentally, uh, the way the learning works in this case is not uh, very amenable to insight. And I think people are finding this out uh, right now with any neural network. Neural networks is much worse actually than this. <laughs> it's, there, there's not a lot of insight that you would get by looking at what the neural network is doing, right? It's a black box. And that's, uh, that hits this point also. The, the designer have a hard time, the tester, uh, the validator has a hard time testing something that's a black box because you don't know what inputs and output combinations you're, you're supposed to get, right? You really need to simulate it in full. I guess there needs to be, a, essentially what I'm arguing is that there needs to be some other design mindset and flow that needs to develop, that needs to be developed to incorporate such controllers and hardware. Okay, and if you're interested, this is the paper. It was published in ISCA 2008. Uh, and I think this is one challenge uh, going forward. Uh, that's, why, that's why I wanted to actually have this lecture before the uh, reliability and security because I think this is going to be important for many other functions uh, in, in hardware controllers. Let me actually take a step back. Uh, I say self-optimizing data-driven computing architectures over here, but let's think about how hardware architectures are designed today. Most of the decisions that we make in the design today are human-driven. Right? Uh, basically, humans design the policies how to do things. I think the only, uh, at least in the hardware architecture, uh, the only place uh, where the, uh, there's an exception is uh, the perceptron branch predictor. Do people know about the perceptron branch predictor? So this is the branch predictor that was developed in uh, late 2000, or in 2001 by Daniel Jimenez. Uh, it's very simple, perceptron is basically the smallest neural network that you can get. It's a single layer <laughs> neural network, the way I think about it. Uh, and basically uh, learns correlations, right? And people have developed branch predictors that can use, uh, per, uh, that use perceptrons to learn the correlations between different history bits and the outcome of this branch. And that's implemented in some processors today. Not all of the processors, but in some processors, uh, like some AMD and Samsung processors. So that's the only exception in hardware. But that's a very simple, uh, 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 that's a very simple uh, machine learning algorithm. But other than that, most of the policies are human driven. The cache policies, the memory scheduling policies, the instruction scheduling policies, all of them are really human driven. As a result, we have many too simple or short sighted policies all over the system. Right? Uh, and there's no automatic data driven policy learning, which means that there is no adaptation to different environments, for example. There's almost no learning. You cannot take lessons from past actions. Uh, you can memorize some things and you can try to do uh, heuristic-based approaches, but there is no learning that's really happening. You know, so. so basically, the key question is, uh, can we design fundamentally intelligent architectures by enabling them to learn uh, by themselves? So uh, what is an intelligent architecture? Essentially, I believe it needs to be data-driven as opposed to human-driven. Basically, machine learns the best policies by looking at the data and looking at what it does and learning from it how to do things. And there is a lot of data, actually. With the, we choose a memory controller. Actually, memory controller gets exposed to a lot of data over time, lots of requests per cycle, right? Uh, and and some, some other parts of the machine get exposed to even more data. So it's easy, easy to get data uh, in the machine. And uh, it, it makes sophisticated, workload-driven, changing, and far-sighted policies, basically. How do you enable such policies? I don't think humans can actually enable these policies easily. Uh, and an intelligent architecture has automatic data-driven policy learning and probably all controllers need to uh, ha be data-driven agents. So I've given you an example of memory controllers, but I believe we need to rethink the design of all controllers in the system if you want to actually have a really data-driven intelligent architecture. And again, this is an open research area. There is not a lot of work in this area. It's increasing slightly, but it's not increasing as much as the work that is out there for uh, accelerating neural networks, for example. There's a lot of work in that direction today, but there's not a lot of work in this particular direction. So I think, I think I've seen some work on using neural networks for memory controllers also. I'm not sure if they work really well, but we'll see. Any questions? Yes, please. I just want to ask, you know, we talked about learning, we need to start a study. Yes. Mm -hmm. And where do we have to start it? Do we start a memory controller? In the memory controller, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's, 
That's a great question, basically. So in the paper, we analyze that latency, and we find out that you could pipeline a lot of that, and you could make decisions early. Uh, but it is a concern, actually, especially with the increasing frequencies that you have in memory. You need to make faster decisions. Um, as a result, that latency becomes a concern. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, yeah, you really need to design the controller. <laughs> I believe it can be handled, yeah. but it, require, it, it, it makes the design a little bit more complicated. Yeah, the paper has some, uh, has an example pipeline of how you would make the decisions. Okay. <laughs> but that's a good point, because you, you really need to, whenever you're in a given state, uh, you really need to get a lot of uh, reward values for different actions you need to take. And the bandwidth of that table is actually problematic. Let me show how to handle that bandwidth. But I'm not saying it's an easy design. <laughs> okay, let me talk about memory interference because we're talking about memory controllers. I, uh, I normally didn't have these slides here, but I cannot avoid putting these slides here, uh, unfortunately, because it's so important in today's memory controllers. We're really talking about, going to talk about memory interference later on, but I'm gonna give you the problem uh, very quickly. Essentially, the problem is that uh, threads share the memory system, but the memory system d doesn't distinguish between threads requests so far, as we discussed it, right, the memory controller. Basically, this is a slide that's old. Things have changed a little bit, but existing memory systems are free for all, shared based on demand. Control algorithms are thread unaware. So for example, the first ready, first come, first serve algorithm doesn't consider anything about different threads, hardware threads that are running on different uh, cores or the same core, right? As a result, aggressive threads can deny service to others, uh, and this is because uh, the, the controllers that we have do not try to reduce or control inter-thread interference. Let me give you an example of this. Um, this is actually the setup of a study that we did, that I mentioned yesterday, uh, that we did in 2006, and I'm gonna mention the paper also. Basically, if you have two cores over here, assume that DRM memory control is unfair, because we know that uh, it's thread unaware and it will be unfair. Assume that you have a streaming application over here and a random access application over here. It turns out uh, if you uh, execute both of these applications on some systems, I don't know if it's true for right, uh, right now on all existing systems, but some systems, the memory controller unfairly prioritizes the streaming application for a long time. And you know by now why that happens, right? Because you're really prioritizing the robot for hits in the memory controller. So I don't need to talk more, but let me give you the experiment we did uh, a long time ago. Basically, we wanted to test this in a methodical way in real systems, and we wrote this application that's streaming, that's based on the stream benchmark. Essentially, what it does is it's sequential memory access, as you can see. It goes to an array, does the copy from one array to another, does other stuff. Uh, it has very high robot for locality as a result of that, and it's very memory intensive because we ensure that every access is a cache miss in this case. And we also had a control application that does exactly the same thing, except it accesses the arrays in a random access manner. Of course, you don't write the application like this if you want to test it like this because this rand function call takes a really long time. It dominates the execution. So you generate the random numbers over here and then you initialize an array and then uh, basically you fudge this uh, uh, such that these two things are equals. But basically this has random memory access, it has very low robot for locality and it's similarly memory intensive, it turns out. So what happens when you run these two applications together? Essentially what I just showed you in the previous picture. So let, let's take a look at it, the internals. Assume that this is a single bank in this case. Thread zero is the streaming application. Thread one is the random application. Row zero is open. Essentially, thread zero keeps sending requests to row zero, and they keep hitting in the row buffer, and the memory controller keeps prioritizing those requests. And thread one's requests get backed up in the memory controller queues, uh, and the memory controller is happy maximizing the ARM throughput. But thread one's request essentially get denied service for a long time. So you can do the calculations actually for a row size of eight kilobytes, a cache block size of 64 bytes. You have 128 requests of uh, the streaming application service before a single request of the random access application because of this. And we actually did these studies with stream and random. I'm gonna show you those later when we talk about uh, memory interference in more detail. But this is, a, an example real workload that we ran, uh, I, I believe on Intel systems at the time, but AMD systems were very similar. Uh, you run MATLAB, 
and GCC. MATLAB is doing a lot of streaming accesses. GCC is more or less random access. It's also not very memory intensive, so it's really a double problem for GCC. Uh, essentially, uh, we found out that uh, compared to when each application is run alone, MATLAB is slowed down by only 7%, but GCC slows down by 3x compared to when it's running alone on the same system, if they're run together. So clearly, there's an unfairness problem. And this unfairness problem is actually caused by the way the memory control is designed, because we bypass the caches, actually, in all of this. Uh, as, as you know already, that uh, because of the huge disparity between the row hit and row conflict memory accesses, can controllers take advantage of the row buffer, and they use the scheduling policy that's row hit first. And that aims to maximize DRAM throughput, and it's designed for a single core system, but when you have multi-threaded uh, systems, or multi-core systems, it becomes unfair. Right? And this is actually the result with the stream and random uh, on the setting that is described over here. Essentially, stream slows down by 18% and random slows down by almost 3x again. Okay, and stream actually turns out to be a very good memory performance attack, or hog. Uh, it basically denies service to other applications, and this used to be Microsoft's virtual machine. We wanted to demonstrate that you actually, if you have virtual machines in the cloud, you cannot satisfy uh, uh, service level agreements because somebody can be running this application on your in your virtual machine. And if you co-locate two virtual machines together, you would not be able to satisfy the uh, service level agreements. This is, this, is, these were, this is a time where cloud computing was actually becoming big in 2006 or so, and people were trying to use multi-core computers to improve the efficiency of cloud computing. But if your memory controller doesn't support uh, fairness, then you have a problem. You cannot co-locate two virtual machines with some service level agreement guarantee requirements because you cannot satisfy them as we showed over here. And this problem becomes burst with more cores. Essentially, this is a vulnerable to denial of service. You're unable to enforce priorities or SLAs. You get low system performance. Why? Uh, because, again, Lip Quantum is a quantum computing simulator. We, we ran this on four core machines. It turns out it's doing a lot of streaming. It's very memory intensive. This is a video encoder decoder. Even though it's very memory intensive, it's not fully streaming, but it's less memory intensive also. This is another simulator. You happen to run these four workloads, this slows down by 5%, this slows down by 8x. So it's not very good. And it's not good for system performance also because th this application is very memory intensive. These are less memory intensive. Uh, this is making slow progress. Even though it's prioritized, it's making very slow progress because it's waiting for memory most of the time. These applications are not being prioritized. They're being slowed down even more. Uh, basically, these are not keeping their cores busy. These cores are busy but they're not making a lot of progress because they're slow to begin with. So you're doing exactly the opposite of what you should be doing for system performance. These are the applications. If you serve their requests, they would go back to their cores and make a lot of progress, actually. So this is actually not good for system performance also, uh, if you care about only system performance. Essentially, this, uh, you have an un uncontrollable and unpredictable system, and also a low-performance system at the same time, if you don't take into account this uh, memory interference. And we showed that, actually, many workloads have this. So for example, uh, this Omnet slows down by 8x when it's run with these workloads. It slows down by, I don't know, 5x when it's run with some other workloads. Basically, your performance is very much dependent on what you're running together with. So your, all of your performance optimizations go out of the window because you're running with some particular uh, type of applications. So this is, I think, a, a very bad thing in general. And this is the paper that really first talked about uh, these issues in memory controllers. And we're going to have a longer lecture on memory interference and quality of service. Of course, we didn't just tell the problem. We need to solve the problem also, right? And this was, at that time, this was a problem, big problem with caches also. Now caches actually have partitioning mechanisms. Intel introduced partitioning mechanisms, good or bad, but at least you can control it. Uh, interconnect also still is mostly uncontrolled today. Memory control is also mostly uncontrolled today, except in some systems. Uh, some SOCs have actually good memory controls that incorporate some of the ideas that I'm going to brush through. But essentially, if you have uncontrolled interference between threads, you need to control it. So how do you control it? You need to essentially design a quality of service aware memory system. In, in, from the memory controller's perspective, uh, it's really uh, figuring out how do you schedule requests to provide high system performance, high fairness, and some configurable system software because you don't want to be making decisions in terms of how to prioritize applications without knowledge of how important those applications are from the perspective of the system, right? Again. Uh, you don't want to design the hardware agnostic or ignoring the software. So our, our controller is actually the, the designs that I'm going to brush, uh, basically uh, flash at you 
but we'll talk about hopefully next week is uh, they all provide some configurable system software such that the system software can say this thread is more important for me compared to this thread. And it can specify the weights of the different threads. And in the later works, we actually said, okay, you can specify the deadlines for the threads also, how much each thread could be slowed down, uh, what is the tolerable slowdown of the different threads. And for this to work, you have to have a memory control that's aware of threads. I don't think there's any other way of doing this. Your memory control needs to be aware of the hardware contexts uh, that are sending requests to uh, itself. And this was the first solution. Again, I'm going to flash these. If you're interested, you can do the readings. I'm not going to require any of them yet. But this was the first solution that we developed. And then this was the next solution. This actually, uh, the principles in the solution are implemented in some of the Samsung SOC con memory controllers. Uh, because I think batching idea, for example, is a very good idea over here. Uh, and some of the other solutions. So if you're really interested, you can take a look at them. I like this one because it blacklists some applications. And then we had a cool acronym over here saying BLISS. Finally, we reached the bliss in memory scheduling. I don't think that's true, actually. There's a lot more to do in this area, but these are all heuristics, by the way. These are, none of this is machine learning at this point because we didn't even know what to do without machine learning in this case. So the first step is we wanted to understand the problem. Uh, okay, and this, this actually takes the problem to the heterogeneous system, CPU and GPU together. That problem actually becomes even worse because CPUs are bad. They, they generate a lot of requests, but if you put a GPU next to it, GPU actually floods the memory system. It actually, it actually makes the scheduling problem terrible because all of the cores are not generating a lot of requests compared to the GPU. So how do you handle this problem uh, while ensuring that CPUs don't get denied service and while also ensuring that GPUs satisfy their requirements, right? Because both of these have requirements in the end. And this is actually the latest work uh, that I believe is the state of the art in memory scheduling, this is even more complicated. It basically looks at CPUs, GPUs, and hardware accelerators, and looks at different types of deadlines and hardware accelerators, because if you have different hardware accelerators, video, audio, GPU, you have different kinds of deadlines, uh, and you need to handle all of those deadlines, while also ensuring that your cores that may be latency sensitive or bandwidth sensitive are getting their requirements satisfied. So it's a, this is actually a real problem. I, I mean, uh, uh, I empathize with the people who design memory controls for this, for example. This is complicated. It's really the center of the world. And I don't think the research community is paying enough attention to that center of the world. <laughs> okay, uh, we also took another route. Basically, uh, this paper looks at uh, providing performance predictability. Like, how do you estimate the slowdown of an application compared to when it's running alone? And how do you use that? And this takes into account caches also uh, when you're actually estimating the slowdown of an application. There's more to do in this area. Okay, I think we're almost done with this particular type of uh, part of the lecture, but there I have some, some more suggested readings. Uh, I think I've already said this, but I, I'm gonna put these slides online. Did everybody get my email yesterday? Okay, because I wasn't sure who was on the list because I got emails from people who are not on the list that I was given. <laughs> I guess you may be one of them, yeah. Uh, okay, so I'll, uh, you can find the slides in the uh, same place uh, today. We're gonna talk about simulating main memory, but we're gonna do that later. I, I won't talk about raw hammer before that, but these are some of the key readings in memory control, but I, I've already copied and pasted a bunch of them. Okay. Okay, so I think these are optional, so maybe I'll leave uh, them to you to look at. Any questions? It's getting really hot here, huh? Okay, so maybe we should take a short break, like five minutes. Uh, and then come back and we'll start with uh, Rohammer.